Um, welcome. Welcome, everybody. We're going to talk about evidence for God. Now, it's really common online when we hear people say that there is no evidence for God and there are no reasons to believe in God. Um, there is actually a ton, I mean, a very large number of very thoughtful reasons to believe in God, to believe in Christ, believe in Christianity. Uh, we're just going to unpack one of those reasons today, give you one really good reason to believe. And this is meant to be a resource video. Uh, me and my buddy Braxton, I'll tell you about this guy, whichever direction he's on that way <laughs> in just a second. Um, I'll tell you about him in just a second. But what we're going to do today, I want to tell you what this video is so you'll know it's worthwhile to stick around for the whole thing. We're going to give a simple overview of an argument for God's existence. Then we're going to give a detailed, careful, thoughtful work through of this using like philosophy, science, things like that. Um, then after we've given that careful walkthrough, so you understand how strong and how robust this argument is, we're going to answer objections. So that's part three. That's actually the part I'm looking forward to the most is when we, we answer a host of objections that come from, uh, non-believers, uh, atheists, whatever stuff online. You totally find this stuff prominently online. Every YouTuber does, does an anti, uh, evidence for God video and they give us these objections. So we're going to do, we're going to do all that. Stick around for that. Then we'll go to your questions from the live chat. And that will be the whole live stream. I think it should be very beneficial. Um, welcome. My name is Mike Winger. I am a pastor in Southern California who does apologetics and theology online. This is the Tuesday live stream. Every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, we do this kind of cool stuff. And I'm joined today by my friend, my honest friend here. Uh, we're actually really friends. Braxton Hunter. Uh, Braxton is the president of Trinity Seminary. And he's like written a, like books and stuff. And he does lots of smart things. And he's got like a PhD. And he doesn't like to talk about all that, but it's true. Um, Braxton, thanks for joining me, man. Hey, I'm excited to be here, Mike. And I am proud to be your friend. <laughs> awesome, That's man. the most and, important credential I had there. <laughs> <laughs> well, he's I, I, I like Braxton. He's a good guy. Um, he has, actually has a YouTube channel. I've linked it down below. Um, I'll tell you more about it later. If you find the content that he shares fruitful, then you're going to want to check out his channel. He does a lot of uh, good stuff um, that you will also find helpful if you like what he says today. So you have to put put your discernment on and go, hmm, do, I, do I like this guy or do I think he's just a weirdo? Um, so yes, here we go. Let's talk about this argument for God's existence. First, we'll get into the simplest way to explain it. And I'm going to uh, put Braxton in the hot seat. Uh, Braxton, if you met someone on the street... And you had just a couple minutes to tell him about this this argument. Um, where would you get started? How would you get us started in this conversation today? Yeah, so um, we're talking about the Kalam, what's known as the Kalam cosmological argument. And what we want to do is, first I want to kind of explain what the force of this is, what it gets you to, and why it's so valuable. And then we'll go over the argument itself. So the argument that people usually... Uh, uh, when they hear the word Kalam, they know we're talking about this specific uh, two premises and a conclusion argument is, is really important, but it's the first step kind of in a case that gets you, I think, to God. And so uh, what we're going to do is we're going to come back to that uh, formal argument in just a few minutes and talk about if we were to get this argument off the ground, if we can do that tonight, what does it get us? What is the payoff, the cash value of that? So, um, it, so let's just let's just say, okay, the argument is meant to get us to the idea that the universe has a cause for its existence. Now, if we could get that, here's kind of where we could go with that. We could say, all right, so if the universe has a cause, can we know anything really about that cause? And we do. We think we can know some things about that cause. What are some things we can know? Well, first of all, we would know that, all right, it's not going to be like the thing that it caused. The creator is not going to be like the thing that it created, right? Um, because that's the thing that was made, and that's what we're trying to explain. So when we talk about the coming into being of the whole universe, we're talking about uh, three things, generally speaking. This is what we're trying to explain. When we talk about the universe, we're talking about these three things, broadly speaking. Time, space, and physical matter. So uh, as hard as it is to imagine there being no time and no space, well, if there was no universe, there'd be no time, there'd be no space, and there'd be no physical matter. Yeah, that's so just, whatever that's just what the universe caused, is, yeah. right? That's right. Those are, those are the things we're trying to explain. Um, and so whatever caused time, space, and matter to come into being, to come into existence, is not going to be those things. It's not going to be in those categories because those are the things that it created or caused. And so that tells us actually a few things. It might, it might not seem like it did, but it, it told us a few things. Number one, the cause of the physical universe would then be timeless. It wouldn't be in time. 
it would it would be spaceless it wouldn't occupy space and since the universe is also matter it would not be made of matter it would be non-material so we have a spaceless timeless non-material something well, we can actually go a little further than that mike and we go further than, than that by saying okay are there things like that well yeah we can think of a couple of things like that one thing like that would be um numbers we call these things abstract objects but like numbers the number four for example um, that could exist spacelessly, timelessly, non-material perhaps, but the number four doesn't really cause anything. It doesn't have what philosophers refer to as causal powers, and so that's not going to work. We need something that's spaceless, timeless, and non-material that can actually do something, that can make something happen. And one thing that would fit the bill would be a mind. A mind could exist, perhaps spacelessly, timelessly, non-material, and it could actually cause something to happen. And there's actually a lot more we could say about why a mind, why a person, and maybe we'll get to those things in a little bit because that gets super interesting. But simply put, it would also have to be powerful enough to create the universe, so it's incredibly powerful, and it would have to be wise enough to do it so it works. So in just a few minutes of talking about what we get if this argument tonight works, is we are on a path toward a spaceless, timeless, non-material, incredibly powerful, exceedingly wise mind as the best explanation for the beginning of the universe. And that's what most Jews and Christians have always thought of when they look at Genesis 1, in the beginning, God. So that's what we have on the table. If this argument that we're going to talk about works, that's what I think we can get to. Yeah, and I think this is neat because all you ultimately need to start the discussion here is that people believe the universe exists <laughs> and then you could start the ball rolling and be like, well, then what, let's talk about what could have caused all this. And it's, it's great. Right, it's yeah. accessible. I, I did this in line one time at Disneyland with a guy where we talked about the Kalam argument, but I didn't use the term at the beginning. I just talked about what could have caused the universe. You know, it's spaceless, timeless, immaterial. It's incredibly powerful. And I'll say, I'm like, this sounds an awful lot like God, you know? And it was, uh, right. it was great. It, it was interesting. It was accessible. Um, but, what, what I want people to know, and I, I want this to be like a kind of like a training video for discussing this, for people to come back to this video and say, ah, I have the argument explained simply, ex it ex have it explained carefully, and I have it defended against objections all in this one video. Um, so we're going to go deeper and we're going to give the careful presentation of the argument. Now, there's lots of ways of presenting the Kalam cosmological argument um, that we call the Kalam, right? But your way, it goes like this. It has three premises and or two premises rather in one conclusion and this is what's called like a syllogism basically it's it's saying hey if these two things are true then this third thing is true i'm just gonna give to the people your argument and then we're going to talk about uh you know what what you think this means or how they can understand the more careful thoughtful way of presenting it so here's the first premise you, you would say whatever begins to exist must have a cause and we're not going to defend it yet but by way of explanation do you want to tell us what you mean by that uh, yeah, well, it, it's it's pretty straightforward, and there's no hidden, uh, you know, there's not, nothing tricky going on here. Whatever begins to exist must have a cause. If something comes into being, if something begins to exist, or maybe you could say starts to happen, there's a cause for that. Th th there's there's something that caused it to come into being. So kind of on the head there, kind of on, on, the, on the head with the whatever begins to exist. Yeah, this isn't like the kind of thing people naturally are going to object to, but it's important as we progress forward. The second <clears throat> premise is that the universe began to exist. So anything you want to explain just by way of understanding this? Yeah, well, the interesting thing about this is William Lane Craig is the modern champion of this argument and uh, has really done a lot to popularize it throughout the, the late part of the 20th century and right up until today. And uh, I think he said, you know, that, that he thought, um, I think he said that he thought that premise two would be the one where he would get most of the contention and that premise one wouldn't really have as much, no, who's going to challenge that whatever begins to exist must have a cause. But he said, actually, both of these get challenged quite a bit. Uh, but, but for most people, and this is one of the great things about the argument, I think, is that while this can be a very philosophically minded argument, these are just simple concepts we're starting with that most people can relate to and say, yeah, okay, I, I can I can grant that. Yeah, the universe began to exist, sure. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, so, so far, we're two premises that are pretty pretty well mean what they say. Okay, and then this leads us to the conclusion, to, to the, I'm, I'm getting messages that my, my microphone level is a little bit low. I'm trying to increase it without making it too loud. 
Um, so hopefully that is a little bit better, you guys. Um, all right, now, <clears throat> so we had premise one, just by to recap, right? Premise one was whatever begins to exist must have a cause. Premise two, the universe began to exist. And then the conclusion, which seems like you already probably can predict this, guys, right? The conclusion is the universe, or <laughs> the universe, <laughs> don't ask me why that happened, has a cause. Universe, I spelled it wrong somehow deleted something anyway uh, okay. that's the conclusion the universe has a cause uh this this would seem to be not be very significant to some people oh okay the universe yeah. has a cause good for you good job braxton a round of applause the universe right. has a cause well uh, right. why is this why is this exciting to you yeah so uh this is this is a basic syllogism and it's structured so that if premise one and premise two are true then the conclusion the conclusion follows and, and must be true um it's a valid syllogism there's no question about that which means that the logical form of it the flow of the argument is is correct it's right the question then would be what we're going to talk about and what what people debate about is whether it is sound and that means whether it represents the truth, right? Um, and now, it, you're right, it doesn't seem like that's a big payoff. You would think, well, why couldn't a naturalist agree with this much? And some of them do. Okay, the universe has a cause, big deal. Uh, God doesn't seem to be anywhere in the premises or the conclusion. That's kind of why I think we started with, if you grant this, where does that leave us? That leaves us in a position where then we can reason toward what that cause must be like. And we can come to some very theistic, uh, that is some, some God conclusions about that. So, um, so yeah, that gets me excited because if we're willing to grant that the universe has a cause, well, then we get to ask the question, well, what's the best explanation for that cause? And God is going to be the best explanation for that cause. So God becomes the best explanation. So in other words, the, the, the argument, the premises and conclusion, they're not meant to function like that's where the discussion ends but rather they're That's to get right. you to where you're sort of forced to then conceptualize. Now, well, then if the universe must have had a cause, what caused the universe? And we get what's called the conceptual analysis that you were giving before. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so often when I state this, Mike, uh, th this, is a, this is a real nuanced point. But often when I talk about this, I'll say I'm going to give you a case that begins with the Kalam for this very reason. Because when my atheist friends will say something like, well, yeah, but God's nowhere mentioned in that argument. Well, that's fine. But it's still a great case for God that begins with the Kalam cosmological argument. So those two things kind of go together, the, the, the formal argument itself and then the, as you said, conceptual analysis, which means uh, our reasoning toward what that cause must be. Yeah, it'd be like if someone was accused of a crime and, um, and the defense goes, you know, or say they're murder. And they're like, well, you know, sometimes knives just just get stabbed into people's heads. It just happens. And so then, then the defense goes, people don't just happen to have knives in their heads for no reason. There's always a reason for it, you know, and it requires a certain amount of force and it requires a certain height of a person at that angle and and uh, da, 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 da. And they build a case for, okay, what we need to do is look at the crime scene and ask who is, who is the sufficient cause of this thing that has happened. Right. And then they try to point at the, the murder, you know, the murderer in this case. In our case, we're looking for a good event, the beginning of the universe and trying to say that God is the best explanation for it. Um, yeah. So what what I think we can do really quick though um, is we can and I, I hope our audio issues are fixed. I I heard it, you I heard I hear you guys. I was getting messages while you're talking. I'm trying to you know multitask here. Um, I'm hoping that that's fixed now. Okay, they're saying it's fixed now. My audio is coming in only on one side. Uh, anyway, it's fixed. Now just glad this, it's not me. <laughs> yes, but uh, back by popular request. See, my cat has not recently been sitting in the chair next to me, but just today she decided to join to join us. So there's the cat cam. There's Moxie. She's asleep. And for those of you who hate cats, um, I, I pity your loveless soul. And for those who love cats, <laughs> there you go. There's the cat cam. She's just slumbering. Moxie's basically just fur with a face on it. That's all she is. Um, anyhow, there you go. So what we're going to do right now is... Um, now, is there, is there more you want to say about this, or should we just go to the objections that people would offer? Well, it's just uh, to, to, you know, yeah, we can go to the objections, but what I want to say is, I, I should probably say this at the top, this is so interesting to me, and I think one of the great things about it is, it is a, an argument 
that, yeah, we're talking about some philosophical stuff and we got a syllogism going here, but it's great because it, 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 it's understandable. People can connect with these things and you don't have to have a PhD in philosophy to understand these categories and to get the reasoning behind it. And frankly, for me, and maybe the reason I'm on here talking about it is that this is my favorite argument for God's existence. And I think it's really, really strong. I've defended it in formal debate um, on several occasions. And I, I just think it is fantastic. And I can't wait to, to for us to get into the objections and uh, respond to what some skeptics have said. Yeah. So to me, the, the thing, it's the objections and the responses to the objections that to me bolsters my confidence in an argument. You know, when you hear people push back at it and then you find good responses, I'm like, OK, this is good. But so far, we'll just say this is this is an airtight argument. If it's true that whatever begins to exist must have a cause for its existence. And if it's true that the universe began to exist, then you can't escape it. The universe has a cause. And uh, then the conceptual analysis of what could cause the universe. God, it seems to me it's obvious that God would be the best explanation for that. You could try to be like, well, isn't it possible? And you could come up with the most far-fetched thing you, you can imagine. But that doesn't mean that's a better explanation. I think God is the best explanation. So let's deal with some objections. Um, and this is the beauty of doing things like in a syllogism is you can evaluate the syllogism carefully. So the first premise, let's talk about it. Is this really a true premise that whatever begins to exist must have a cause? Um, now, uh, one of the objections to this is that this argument can be used against God and it can be used to say that God therefore must have a beginning or, or an a beginning to exist moment and he must therefore have a cause. So in Richard Dawkins, in his book, uh, the, the God Delusion, um, which is a not a first rate piece of philosophical work. It, I mean, it's been very convincing and it's persuaded a lot of people, but the reception amongst thinkers has not been very positive. One of his biggest accusations against believing in God is, well, if you want to give God as the reason for the existence of the universe, then you have to answer who made God, who made God. Um, so how do you respond to that saying that premise one could be turned against the theist? Yeah, well, first of all, it's interesting because atheist philosopher Michael Roos uh, said, I think precisely because of this about Dawkins' book that it made him embarrassed to be an atheist. So no offense to Richard Dawkins, but but you're right. Uh, just because someone is a, and this is a good thing for people to keep in mind, just because someone is a professional in one area like biology, it doesn't necessarily make them qualified to talk about philosophy. That is a, a field all of its own. And so that's a very important thing to mention. Yeah, so... Um, uh, to lead into this and in answering this, what I love, one of the things I love about this argument comes up here, and it's that um, it's it's a simple enough argument that like both of my daughters when they're each about six years old came to me and said, Daddy, I know that there must be a God because if there was no God, where'd all this stuff come from? You know, and uh, but then and so so I think it's 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 kind of intuitive that way, but it's also complex enough that philosophers can debate about it. But then the next question that often comes up to people's minds, and kids think of this, and Richard Dawkins thinks of this, and that is, if that's the case, then doesn't that mean God needs a cause? Now, this comes, I think, from misunderstanding this premise, because the premise is whatever begins to exist must have a cause. But in order to get to the conclusion that God needs a cause, you would have to misunderstand premise one to say whatever exists must have a cause. We're not saying everything that exists needs a cause. We're saying everything that begins to exist needs a cause. Now, you might say, well, okay, well, what does that mean? Here's what that means. Uh, things that are timeless <laughs> don't have beginnings or endings. Beginning and ending are, thing, are terms that have their relevance in kind of a temporal realm. They, they matter in time. But if God exists timelessly, stands the universe, not in time, then it would simply be categorically an error to talk about God having a beginning or ending. And the only things that need causes for their beginnings are things that have beginnings. So God doesn't have a beginning. God doesn't need a cause. Mm -hmm. So we kind of avoid this problem altogether just by clarifying what exactly premise one says. Yeah, now to me, this is exciting because <clears throat> what we've done is we've sort of just ruled out a whole bunch of definitions of God that are non-Christian definitions, like like pagan ideas of God, where, where each God has its own beginning moment, its own creation story. This God came from such and such. And the idea is that if you have a God that didn't, it doesn't exist eternally, 
then you have a God that requires an explanation. It requires not just an explanation, but a cause. Because um, you can have an explanation for an eternal God. He is his own explanation. And that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> but but it, it, it kills the idea that, um, that Zeus can explain to us the beginning of the universe, that pagan deities right. can, and that even some, uh, some versions of, say, Mormonism, uh, where God is, and he organizes matter, but time and space and matter and energy, they're eternal on Mormonism. And and God was not always God. And so all of a sudden you're, you're like, wait a minute. So then the God that the evidence is pointing towards is not the God of Mormonism. That's significant to me. Um, there's another one. Yeah. Um, did you want to comment on that? No, I, th I think that's good. I think Mormonism is a great example because you, you you have to explain that father, that heavenly father, with another heavenly father who needs then another heavenly father, and it just keeps going back infinitely. Whereas yeah. if we have a God that is timeless, then it resolves that, I mm -hmm. think, that problem. Yeah. All right, so here's another objection. And this is called the, uh, and I'll try to present it carefully. You can correct me if I, if I put it out wrong. This is an objection to premise one. Uh, this one is a, called the composition fallacy. And it's the idea um, that just because every part of the universe, you know, has a cause, every, you know, that doesn't mean the whole thing has a cause. And this was brought up by Cosmic Skeptic, who's an extremely popular uh, atheist YouTuber who has a video trying to debunk the Kalam, and he brings this up in his video. And th the way it works is kind of like this. It's like saying just because every brick in a wall is small, it doesn't mean the wall is small. And so it's a composition fallacy. Just because each part is this doesn't mean the whole thing is this. Now, what would be your response to this saying, hey, Braxton, you're just assuming that the universe must have a, a, a cause just because everything in it that has a beginning has a cause? Well, uh, for the dog lovers, I would like to represent dog lovers on this uh, cat loving uh, channel and say that uh, my favorite analogy is dogs are made of atoms and um, and uh, atoms are invisible to the naked eye. Therefore, dogs are invisible to the naked eye. OK, that argument is not sound because it's not true. Um, also, just for those listening out there, there is some recent research that demonstrated that um, low church attendance is uh people that attend church less are more likely to own cats that is an actual study it's on my uh, twitter yeah, so you yeah, check yeah, that yeah. Out. yeah I but saw you're that. breaking the mold you're 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 the you're you're the unusual type guy I am uh, unusual. but anyway yeah my I, I wish i had my dog i don't have a dog cam but uh, my dog indy is at home all right so uh so what are we talking about composition fallacy so yes. yeah it's true that, that that there can be a fallacy there that that what is true of the parts of something is not necessarily true of the whole but that first of all one thing that needs to be understood is that's not there's not always a fallacy there sometimes there is a truth so an example that comes up sometimes is like let's say you had a, a fence and each picket of that fence is red and the whole fence is red because each picket of the fence is red mm -hmm. okay that there's no fallacy there so it's not necessarily the case that there's a fallacy going on whenever we talk about the parts and the whole of something so that needs to be mentioned mm -hmm. But secondly, and more importantly, is it's a misunderstanding of what we're saying. It's not just that we're saying that, hey, um, every instance that, we're, uh, that we see in the physical universe of something beginning to exist or starting to happen, there's a cause. Um, so that must mean that the whole universe has a cause. Um, it's, it, we're not just saying that. We're mm -hmm. saying that when things begin to exist, fundamentally, there must be a cause for them beginning to exist. So like when we talk about the physical universe coming into existence from a state of nothingness, Let's think about what that means. What is nothing? That's actually, that may sound like a simple question, but it's actually a really important question when we talk about this stuff. Because there are some people in, uh, that are atheist physicists even, who talk about nothing as though it's something. You might hear them say something like, well, look, the nothingness out there that, that before the universe began, or sans the physical universe, that nothingness has no limitations. There's, there's nothing holding nothingness back. And yeah. so no, perhaps nothingness could create Something like a universe. And maybe nothingness is omnipotent. <laughs> or, and maybe nothingness is omnipotent, right? <laughs> yeah. But the thing about it is, we're not when we when we say nothing, we're more accurately talking about not anything, mm -hmm. because they're talking about nothingness as though it's something. So it's kind of like um, one of William Lane Craig's favorite ways to talk about it is if somebody said nothing stopped the German advance. You say, oh, thank God nothing was there to stop the German advance. Yeah. Well, that'd be ridiculous, right? Uh -huh. We're saying not anything was there. Um, so when we say yeah. not anything, nothing, what we mean by that is no possibilities, no properties, no potentialities, 
um, nothing. And if you have no potentialities, no properties, no possibilities, then you simply can't have anything begin to exist. And uh, again, as, as people that talk about this often say, if it could, if it could cause something, then why is nothing only interested in causing universes? Why don't uh, basketballs and Beethoven and, and things like that come pop into existence? Mm -hmm. So it's not just that everything we see that begins to exist has a cause. Although, if you want to pour a little gravy on it, it is true that 100% of our experience does bear this out, and there are zero counterexamples to this. So that's just a misunderstanding of why we say it. We say it because uh, when something begins to exist, there just needs to be a cause. And yeah. if you're talking about the universe, nothing just can't cause something. Yeah. So um, <clears throat> to kind of like summarize one of the points you were making there, um, in a simple way, it's if I do this right here, it, it's the idea that... Um, that a composition fallacy requires that we're saying all the parts of something do something, therefore that thing is is tr it's true of the thing itself as well as a whole. That's mm -hmm. a composition thing. But we're not doing that. We're saying things of this class, things that begin to exist. That's a class. It's not about com it's not about putting the things together. It's just about having them in that class, that category. That's absolutely right. Yeah. And so the class is it begins to exist. It has a cause. That's true with our hundred percent true with our life experience. Science depends upon this. When they put a petri dish out, they're depending on the idea that something's not going to pop into existence out of nothing in the middle of the dish and ruin the experiment. And so, yeah, lots of good reasons to think that. Um, let's talk a little bit about quantum physics. You brought up Lawrence Krauss um, and another, I mean, well, I said Lawrence Krauss. That's the guy I was thinking of as you were talking about some atheists want to say that nothing is is something effectively. Lawrence Krauss is the guy who does that. Um, but yeah, he's got in a, the book, area of, a, a universe from nothing. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah. he treats nothing like it's something. Right. And then calls something nothing, and then it's it's just really it's it's a bait and switch. Uh, but with the issue of quantum physics, uh, this is brought up kind of on the popular level. We hear quantum physics, and people start thinking, "Well, anything can happen," you know, because they hear qu quirky, weird things about quantum physics. Uh, Stephen Hawking, in his book, uh, he wrote the following: that because of the law of gravity, the universe can and will create itself out of nothing. And so he's saying, yeah, no, it, it can just make itself out of nothing. We don't need to look beyond the universe for a cause. And so what do you think about that? So um, I recently read a couple of great books on quantum mechanics. It is really interesting. Um, I have a video on it. I, I, I read a book called The Quantum Enigma from Oxford University Press, uh, The Ghost in, in the Atom. There's a lot of good stuff out there on it. I've really tried to educate myself on this. Um, uh, and, and it is fascinating, and, and there are some quirky things, like you say, happening there. But let's just take what you just said. First of all, what is Hawking's nothing? What is Krauss's nothing? We're talking about a roiling sea of fluctuating positive and negative energy. Um, you already just said we have gravity. That's something. That's not nothing, right? That's part of his nothing there. Mm -hmm. You've got positive and negative energy. That's not nothing. You've got space for that to occur in. That's not nothing. And so a lot of times when you hear them say things like, well, you could have in, in quantum physics, we are aware of things coming into existence uncaused out of nothing. They're not uncaused and they're not out of nothing in the sense that we're talking about here. It's only when you get to that nothing stopped the German advance and, and, and you know, you're thinking, oh, thank goodness nothing was there to stop it. No, no, no. We're talking about not anything. And that's not what Hawking is talking about. And that's not what Krauss is talking about. And even if we were to grant that much, quantum physics um, is still a pioneer field in a sense. And, and while we have a lot of great innovations, be, then we're using quantum physics. There are various uh, theories and understandings about quantum physics, and none of them require this uh, coming, uh, causing something to come into existence uncaused out of nothing in the sense that we're talking about it here on this stream. Yeah. So uh, I think that that's f a fun way to try to get out of it. Um, but it can also run into a hopeful like, hey, maybe there's something there that can that can give us an example of something like this. But so far, I just think that we have to the atheists have to do better than that. Yeah, you know, I watched a video that was a two hour. This is what I do with my free time. Apparently, it was a two hour discussion at the Isaac Asimov Memorial something or other thing. It's on YouTube. You can watch it. It's got Lawrence Krauss. It's got um, Neil deGrasse Tyson. And it's got some other guys. And they're literally discussing what exactly is nothing. What do we mean by nothing? Right. And so Krauss and and Tyson, who are lean towards atheism, um, Tyson calls himself agnostic, but they lean towards atheism and their views. 
uh, they're both kind of like, you know, he ho-humming about how complicated and interesting. I like how Cross goes, it turns out nothing is very interesting. <laughs> yeah, and by right. that, he means a bunch of something, right? Like there's actual, there's space, yeah. there's energies, there's fluctuations, there's laws, there's all this stuff going on. Um, yeah. What was great was at the end of this lecture, they finally get to the philosopher. They had one philosopher that was there on the board or on the, you know, on the panel. And they finally get to him and the guy's slouched in his seat and he's visibly irritated. And he's like, this whole discussion is a total waste of time. Nothing means not anything. You guys are just saying things and calling it nothing. And he was really frustrated with them. And um, yeah. I thought it was entertaining to have some sanity brought into that discussion. <laughs> so, Absolutely. So yeah. I mean, honestly, you, you, sometimes you'll think when you hear something like that, you're like, maybe I just misunderstand what they're saying. They can't possibly be saying that nothing is a, a roiling sea of positive and negative energy and we've got gravity in space and all these kind of things. And that's nothing. Yeah. No, that is that is what some of them are saying. It, it sounds surprising, but mm -hmm. it is. Yeah. Um, but here we're talking about not anything. Not anything. Yeah, we, we just... and. And they would say that, that at some point in the past, there was not anything. They just teleport forward to a moment where there's a bunch of little tiny stuff and then guess that maybe everything came out of that. But everything doesn't keep coming out of that, even though that little tiny stuff is everywhere. It's just, anyway. Let's talk about the multiverse. Uh, one of the uh, things that last one on premise one here, and there's a lot of objections to premise one we wanted to cover, is that, um, well, maybe there's just lots of universes. There's tons and tons of universes. And so, um, yeah, we're, we're, we're just, we're going back and back and back and there's billions, trillions, gazillions of universes. H how does that affect this argument? And then what's your response to it? Yeah. So, um, in, in my debate with Matt Dillahunty, this came up, he said, Hey, look, um, yeah, this local representation of the universe does seem to have had a beginning and does, and does seem to have had a cause and needed a cause or whatever, as far as we can tell. But we don't know, you know, it could be part of a multiverse. And, and he talked about how Sagan, Carl Sagan, referred to the entirety of everything that exists, even the multiverse, as the cosmos, which, of course, is just a Greek word that means world. And so, uh, but the great thing about this, this is so great, when people bring that up, the, everything that we're saying philosophically here, all, all the things we've just said about this universe that we're inhabiting, if there is a multiverse, if that is real, it would all apply to the multiverse as well. You're just kicking the can back up the street. And so uh, the multiverse would need a cause, right? So, mm -hmm. And then the other things that we're going to say in just a few minutes when we get to premise two, perhaps, those things all would apply to the multiverse as well. So mm -hmm. positing a multiverse doesn't get you out of this. I think where some skeptics think maybe the multiverse would be helpful is with a different argument for God's existence called the fine-tuning argument. Um, and they think if they have enough universes, maybe one of them will be like ours where people can develop and it can be life-permitting. But as far as this is concerned, you're right, it does get brought up. But I just don't think it's helpful because everything we've said here we can say about the multiverse. Yeah, it seems like a distraction. It's like saying, um, <clears throat> you know, when we, my murder analogy. Oh, you want to explain that murder? Yeah, but there's tons of people getting murdered, Mike. <laughs> like yeah, yeah so <laughs> we still have to explain. We still have to exp now. Now we just have to explain more of them. Is the thing. Um, mm -hmm. So let's look at premise number two, which is uh, that the universe began to exist. Premise two. Not a, not too many objections to this one actually uh, that we're covering here today. You guys are welcome to put them in the in the live chat as questions, and we'll take those questions in a little bit here. Um, but some say, well, the universe didn't begin to exist, Braxton. I think the universe was infinite in the past. Or actually, more often what I hear is skeptics or atheists online, they like to say, maybe the universe was infinite in the past. Like, they don't want to kind of hang their coat on that. Uh, they don't want to be responsible for that claim. They just like to say, maybe. Um, so what do you think about that? Yeah, so uh, imagine that on the screen right now, um, you see a line, a horizontal line. And there's an arrow on the right-hand side of that line that indicates the future. We're going, this is the timeline, and we're going into the future. But now imagine an arrow on the left-hand side of the line that indicates the past. And there is, no, there is no beginning to the line. That arrow indicates it goes on back through history into the past forever and ever and ever and ever infinitely. Now, I always like to clarify what we mean by infinitely, because people use it colloquially in everyday language, and I think not in the most helpful way. Like we might say, well, there's an infinite number of stars in the sky. And we mean by that it, it seems innumerable. But there is actually a number. as uh, you know, It'd be a ridiculously big number, but there's still a number. Um, or there's an infinite number of grains of sand on the beach. Well, there's actually a number. I mean, it's obscenely high, but there is a number of grains of sand. When we say infinite, 
there just isn't a number. It just is forever and ever and ever. And then you're just getting started. If we're saying that the past, there, there's two problems here. One, if we're saying that the past is like that, that it's infinite, then that means that number one, there was no starting point to start traveling through history, right? To get to this point that we're experiencing right now. Now, this is a little bit mind bending and maybe you have to listen to this video a couple of times, but if there was no beginning, how would you ever start traveling along the timeline to get to this moment that we're experiencing right now tonight on this live stream? Um, it's kind of like JP Moreland puts it this way. It's kind of like trying to jump out of a hole without a bottom to it. How would you ever jump out of a hole if there's not a bottom to it, right? Um, and don't say anything silly like maybe you could ninja off the walls. It doesn't work like that. You couldn't. You could never. You could never uh, get to the, get get out of the hole because you can't jump, right? Yeah. How would you ever get to this moment? But then there's a second problem, and the second problem is, um, and it's kind of the same problem but stated a different way, is how could you ever cross an actual infinite number of moments to get to this moment mm -hmm. that we're experiencing right now? And this this one you're about to explain up. this this to me is really compelling. Um, based because now these this is these are philosophical reasons. To me, there's philosophical reasons enough to say that the universe had a beginning. We do have science that supports it, uh, but I think the philosophical reasons are enough to convince me. Um, so I'm, anyway, I just want people to know that I find this very interesting. Uh, so go for it. Yeah, I think in, in addition to that, and this goes back to your your cosmologist Neil deGrasse Tyson sitting on the stage with a philosopher, right? Is uh, you'll often run into skeptics who will say. Something like, well, yeah, but the physicists don't agree with you. Well, why do you need to be a physicist to understand the philosophical point that the universe can't be infinite into the past? Mm -hmm. So so here's the reason why you can never get to today if you were trying to cross, even if you had a starting point, which you don't, how would you ever cross infinity to get to today? And, and why is that a problem? So I like this one. Imagine you've got a library, an infinite library with an infinite number of books. Remember, that doesn't mean a whole lot. It means there isn't a number. It's that many. All right, this leads to all kinds of problems. So let's imagine that every other book is red and every other book is black. And you remove half of the books. You take all the red books out so that all that are left are black books in the infinite library. How many books do you have now? Well, you've got infinite, right? You have the yeah. same number of books. And, and yet you took half of them out. How is that possible? Well, you run into these absurdities. Yeah. But in the same way, imagine that if you tried to cross half of infinity to get to today, You'd still have infinity to go. You'd have made no progress. And mm. that's why if the past is literally infinite, then we could have never gotten to this moment. Yeah, I like to think of it this way. I think we all understand that it's ridiculous to actually count to infinity. Like if I counted one number for every second, one, two, three, would I, you know, how long would it take till I counted to infinity? Well, it's never mm. going to happen. I will, I could count for a million, billion, trillion, gazillion years. It's never going to happen. But in effect, if I say the universe is past eternal, I'm saying the universe has counted past infinite seconds to get to this moment here. Right. What? what? <laughs> like it's successfully yeah. counted past infinity, yet it's counting more seconds. Yet is it adding more than infinite? Does it have infinity plus now? No, because infinity is not even really a number. It's just an idea. That's right. Yeah. And it's an idea of something That's that, right. that and can't happen in certain situations like uh, the, the age of the universe. Yeah. Yeah, you can't get to infinity by successively adding uh, one, two, three, four. And so you could do that with time. You could never get there by just adding another moment. Now, what some people will say is, yeah, but if you're imagining it like a line, you can have a point on the timeline. You can have, and that can be today. Yeah, that's fine. But whenever people say that, I always wonder, obviously you could have a point. The question is, how did you get to that point when you have an infinite past? So mm -hmm. yeah, I think that that answers it. It's a little bit difficult to wrap your mind around. Uh, but I think there's a moment when you think about that long enough where it clicks for you and then you, it, the force of it kind of hits, like you said it does for you. Yeah. Yeah. Now, I have heard people respond to it by saying, well, you know, weird things happen. And and I I understand that, but I'm I'm inclined to think that if, if you even have better reason to think the universe can't, you know, be infinite on that argument than to think that weird things happen as a re as a rejoinder or response to it then i think you should you should fall on this side and say yeah the universe has a beginning um yeah so are there other reasons uh, to suggest the universe really did have a beginning you know i think that um w with this with this one we're talking about the universe began to exist really 
if you can't have an infinite past, I think this one is good enough. And and to go on the heels of what you just said, uh, a lot of times people will point to the early moments of the universe and they'll say, look, that that time and that infinitesimally small point and everything is so different there that, that maybe, like you said, maybe you could have something really weird happen that we don't understand. And, uh, I, you know, I think uh, I don't remember who said it exactly. I know Craig has said it, but it's like that he says it's like the edges of a map people point to that moment at the beginning almost like the edges of an old time sailing map where it says here be dragons it's like this is the area where i can put all the weird stuff because nobody's yeah. ever been there you know so yeah, yeah but i think if the universe can't be infinite it had to have a beginning yeah yeah the phrase i hear from people sometimes they go well the laws of physics break down and I think that's an inaccurate description of what's actually happening on the on the micro level, like say of quantum stuff. It's not that the laws of physics break down. It's just that we're not sure exactly what's going on there. But it's not. Right. I mean, we have we have quantum, you know, events taking place all around us all the time. But we don't see any universes suddenly, like you know, some in my kidney all of a sudden a universe pops into existence and I'm just exploded into a billion pieces. Like we don't see this happen. There's no reason to think it's going to happen. It's okay to use common right. sense guys it's okay to just say yeah that doesn't make any sense um let's talk about um the conclusion the conclusion which is the universe has a cause i'm not going to put it up because i feel i feel like a, a, a dumb dumb here i'll put it up just to make fun of myself i don't know how i did that you universe i think i typed too fast for the I love uh, it. for the for photoshop as i was printing this out anyway the universe has a cause that's the conclusion that's what we come down to um so here's kind of a a, a, a complex objection that happens um, and it has to do with, I, I wasn't sure if I bring this one up, but it has to do with people say, well, that's equivocation. You know, in the in the first premise, you're saying everything that begins to exist must have a cause. In the conclusion, you're saying, you know, the universe has a cause, but you're using the word cause differently. Um, in the in the first premise, you're, you're, you mean a material cause. And then the last premise, you mean an efficient cause. And therefore, this is a, a trick. It's a fallacious argument. Um, for those who need this, if you don't care about this, just skip ahead. If you're watching the replay of this video, skip ahead a minute. But why don't you uh, address this for those who might need it? Yeah. So like, uh, so a material, the material cause is, is so like, if you imagine Michelangelo, uh, chiseling the, you know, some statue or something, uh, the material cause is, is the, the rock that's being chiseled out of the efficient cause is the agent that brought it about. And, uh, and, and so the thing that, the thing that brought it about agent can be personal or impersonal. So, um, <clears throat> so what we're saying, so the, the criticism says, okay, well, in the first premise, you're talking about the material cause and the conclusion, you're talking about an efficient cause. So it's a bait and switch. It's an equivocation fallacy, which is when you're using um, the same word uh, in, the, in, in a context, in the same context, but giving it a different meaning. But there's a simple solution to this. In both cases, we're talking about an efficient cause in both cases. So uh, the, the the equivocation fallacy goes away because it's just a misunderstanding of what's being said. Because yes, it is true that there are material causes, but there are also efficient causes with those material causes. So in, in the premise one and the conclusion, it's an efficient cause. Awesome. <clears throat> okay, um, what about this? Uh, and I hear this from lots and lots and lots of skeptics, tons of times. They go, hey, look, here's the issue. You mention, okay, the universe began to exist, fine. This doesn't mention God. Your argument doesn't even mention God. Therefore, it's irrelevant to the discussion of God's existence. I hear this a lot. Yeah. I've heard, and the thing is that atheists online, they tend to get their material, just like Christians, they get their material from Christians online, right? They get their material from other atheists that are online. So it's just this oft-repeated claim, like kind of like a, like a, like a smackdown, like boom, you know, <laughs> I can throw your whole yeah. argument out the window. Uh, what's your response to this that the argument yeah. doesn't mention god <clears throat> yeah so the 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 thing that happens is i've heard atheists say it's somewhat a uh, not very interesting of an argument because what if i just granted the whole thing you still don't have god like you said the problem is we should never skip the kalam because this this formal argument we've given because the thing is, we will then inevitably get to things in the conceptual analysis that comes after the argument that we would have covered in the in the Kalam, like the universe can't be past infinite and stuff like that that would have come up in those discussions. And um, so that's this is why a while ago I said, when I'm discussing this, just to be very nuanced and very specific, because a lot of people like, you know, if you've got a YouTube channel, people like to pick apart everything you say. I try to be careful and say a case that begins with the Kalam. Mm -hmm. But it's always the case. It is always the case that whenever a, a Christian apologist brings the Kalam, 
they always follow it with a conceptual analysis. So much so that when somebody talks about the Kalam, all of that just in our heads all kind of comes together, uh, even though the Kalam is referring to that formal syllogism. So your question actually sets up a great segue to talk more about the conceptual analysis, mm -hmm. because that's where it in inevitably leads. Yeah, and we're going to do that right now, and then we're going to go to your guys' questions. Um, but but just as a reminder, yeah, like when I actually witness to people with this, I start with the conceptual analysis. Like, what could have create, what could have caused the universe? And if they push against me, well, I don't think it was caused. And then I can say, well, everything that begins to exist has a cause, and and then you bring him back to this conceptual analysis. So so here's where like yeah. the the payoff is here. It's in the conceptual analysis. The Kalam forces you to do this. That's that's all it's really ultimately doing. Is my view. Um, now. I've had some people say, okay, conceptual analysis, right? You've got something that's like spaceless, timeless, it's not material, um, it has all these qualities. Um, and I've, I've heard a response, I'm not kidding, from, I'm taking these from real people, right? Atheists who say, well, I would just say that maybe, why, why can't that be a teacup orbiting Saturn? There's a spaceless, timeless, immaterial, super powerful teacup orbiting Saturn, and that's the thing that created everything. Uh, well, <laughs> I, I'm sorry to bring this up. But somebody thinks this is a good argument. What's your response to it? Well, what the person ends up doing is just describing God and calling it a teacup, right? It's a spaceless, timeless, non-material, sufficiently powerful mind, and we're going to call it a teacup. <laughs> Honestly, in my preparation uh, for debating Matt at Dillahunty, I had heard him talk about this, and I'd heard him say he didn't use a teacup. He said, maybe it's a group of pixies. Uh, universe creating pixies. He said this many times. Now, it, he's saying it tongue in cheek, right? Mm -hmm. He's not saying it like the person you're talking about who thinks it's a really good argument. But but still, saying it tongue in cheek, if if we we only need one of those pixies, Occam's razor says to get rid of all the extra stuff you don't need to explain something. Mm -hmm. So we only need one pixie. It's a spaceless, timeless, non-material, sufficiently powerful, universe creating pixie. Okay, you've just... You've just uh, you just described God and then called God a pixie. You're yeah. a pixie theist, but welcome to theism, pixie theist. Yeah. So in, in other words, you know, if you say it's a teacup, well, teacups are in space and time and they're made of matter. So it's you're, it's it's mislabeling God as a teacup. It's pixies right. aren't don't they don't have all these qualities like they have wings, for instance, right? They exist with physical oh, but this bodies. Is a special pig. This is a special pixie, that's special spaceless pixie. and timeless. Yeah, <laughs> in which case, it's just a, it's just yeah. a term. It's just I'm just going to come up with a right. now. To me, this is the last ditch effort to get away from saying it's God, um, and it demonstrates right. that that the argument has devolved where they don't have an a, an answer to it, and so they say something that at that point I'm like I don't know how to help you, man, because you're you're just you're just saying things. But um, let's take another uh, objection, which is, isn't this just a God of the gaps? argument isn't it really mm. just we don't know what caused it so god did it isn't that just a god of the gaps argument right so like ancient peoples might have seen lightning and not known what it was so it was god throwing thunderbolts or something right mm -hmm. god we don't know what that is so we're going to say god did it um the the problem there is what you're doing that's a situation where you you don't you don't have any you don't have positive evidence for what it is so you're just putting god there we're actually giving you positive evidence for what for why this seems to be a spaceless, timeless, non-material, incredibly powerful, sufficiently wise mind. Um, we're, we're giving positive reasons to believe that. It's not that we don't know, so we're saying God. Um, <clears throat> so, so that's kind of how you respond. That's how I respond to that mm -hmm. uh, criticism. Yeah, it's like argument to the best explanation or looking for something that could sufficiently explain it. I mean, because you could go to the courtroom and say, well, that guy didn't commit the murder. You just have a Bob the murderer of the gaps. You know, you don't know how the knife got in that guy's head. You don't know how Bob's fingerprints got right. on the knife. You don't know how to explain his uh, his earlier death threats to that person. So you have a Bob of the gaps. But like, wait a minute, this is this is not, Bob it's not Bob of the gaps. <laughs> it's not God of the gaps. This is a uh, best explanation for the evidence. Sorry for my... Yeah. Cheese ball analogy, but I love um, that. Bob, I'm going to say Bob of the Gaps from now on. I love that. <laughs> Bob of the Gaps. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, let's take another one. Uh, what if science one day explains the beginning of the universe without God? Yeah. So two things about this. One is um, often we hear the criticism that this, if we accepted what you're saying right now, it'd be the end of science because why would we need to investigate any further? Why would cosmologists need to do their experiments and things like that? Christians are happy for 
people to continue for the, the you know science to continue studying the beginning of the universe we're not saying to stop that in fact we're even okay with scientists doing what we call methodological naturalism where while they're studying it while they're doing it even people who are christians who are scientists you're you're we're not letting you posit supernatural stuff you just push this as far as natural science can take it we're fine with that we're not self-conscious about that one bit and we want that to continue because we think that christianity is perfectly happy to be in the marketplace of ideas and it's going to be perfectly safe there we're not worried about that and you should continue doing that uh so so that's off the table but the, the deeper thing here is well maybe if we just wait long enough and naturalism will get to it that's kind of like a naturalism of the gaps, isn't it? We, it's not a bob mm. of the gaps anymore. It's a naturalism of the gaps. So, yeah, uh, because there is yeah. no indicator that this beginning was caused by some natural thing. And it's especially confusing because it's like bootstrapping. I mean, we're asking that something, the existence of all nature was caused by nature, but all the things we use in nature to explain things are the things we're trying to explain. And so it, yeah. it seems really unlikely and tend to just say, well, what if... It's, it's like the old meme uh, from Dumb and Dumber, right? Like, so you're saying there's a chance, you know? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it ends right. up feeling that way. But it, yeah, it, it's, it, it, Craig often says about it, this argument is not a bus where when you start to get uncomfortable, you can just get off the bus. This thing goes all the way and you got to ride it all the way and follow the evidence where it leads, right? Mm -hmm. And so this thing goes far past a simple stopping point where we can say, I'm not comfortable with where this is heading. So we're just going to stop here and say, I don't know. Or stop here and say, I don't know, but maybe naturalism one day. Um, you can say, I don't know, but we need to make sure that we're being epistemically honest. If we can know a little bit more than that point, then we need to follow past that point to what we can know. Yeah. Yeah. If you only don't know whenever the obvious conclusion seems to be God, then I'm wondering why you don't know. Um, yeah. Why don't you know? <laughs> so here's the thought. Um, why would you say, let's say this cause is super powerful. Okay. It has sufficient power to create the whole universe. Um, it's not material. It's not in space. It's not limited by time. So it's not limited by any of these things. It has these sort of unlimited characteristics. But then we have this. Why would you think this being is personal? Why would you think it's personal? Yeah, so there are a couple of reasons. First off, remember, we're looking for something that can fit the category of spaceless, timeless, and non-material but that has causal power. So you'll recall at the beginning of the episode, we were talking about how like um, the number four might exist that way, maybe, but it doesn't, it can't do anything, right? Uh, we need something that can do something and a mind would fit the bill. Now where someone might say here, okay, maybe it could, but that's not good enough. Um, how do I know that it did? Okay, there's a couple other things that I think are really good here. So first of all, we have different types of causation. And um, I, I, this can sound technical, but I don't think it is. Just hang with me. We have event, event causation. That's where like if I took a book and threw it through a window, the event caused the other event of the window breaking. Um, we understand that. We have state, state causation where you've got like a frozen pond and a log resting on top of that pond. The state of the frozen pond is causing the state of the log to be suspended on top of the water. And then you have what's called state event causation. Now, state event causation is interesting. Imagine a man sitting in a chair uh, and, and he's sitting there without moving and then all of a sudden he stands up. He went from a state of sitting uh, without moving to an event of standing up from his chair. That state event causation requires, in, from a timeless state like this of nothingness, it requires a decision to act out of this timelessness and to cause an event. And so you get this state event causation, and so that's a personal agent that explains that. But then there's another one that I really like, and it's this. Uh, if you have nothing, if you're in a state of timeless nothingness, now there's no time, no space, no matter, then that means that there is no causal chain, like there's no dominoes falling, like you can imagine, there's no determinism is what we mean. Mm -hmm. um, and so if there's no determinism to cause an event to take place, and there's nothing random happening, because there's no time or space for anything random to happen, then that means that whatever caused the universe to come into existence must have had what we call libertarian freedom, free will, the ability to decide. Well, what sort of things have the ability to decide? Well, personal agents do, right? Mm -hmm. So there are two or three good reasons to think that it's a personal agent. Another one that we could layer on top of that is simply this. 
Um, and this kind of would get into another argument, the design argument that some of you all are probably familiar with. Uh, you probably heard about design arguments at least. And we have to remember that this universe that did begin to exist began to exist in such a way that life would be possible. It kind of all worked. And that seems to indicate a certain level of thought, forethought, planning, those kind of things. Yeah, and to me, that the that's the most compelling one to me personally because it just clicks you know, in my thinking is that I look at the universe and I think this is um, this is planned. Like there, there's an, there's intent here for creating life, and then we can bring the argument for fine tuning alongside this as well, and say, look, you know, the the improbability of the random occurrence of the laws of physics, along with the 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 quantities of of material and immaterial well material things in the universe, along with the way chemistry works together, all these things to allow for life to exist is. Um, astounding and it, it seems like it requires a planning thoughtful creator um but now <clears throat> here's a thought some uh this is the last objection then we're gonna then we're gonna go to uh, your guys questions from the live chat so i'm interested to see what kind of questions we'll get today hoping for some pushback and hopefully we can bring helpful answers to you um some would say well braxton this only gets you god okay fine you have god but what you don't have is the god of the bible and you you really you really need more than that uh what are your responses to that well, I want people to notice here that when when we've listed off these different things, spaceless, timeless, non-material, incredibly powerful, exceedingly wise mind, we have given a justification for each of those things. Now, uh, perhaps if you're a skeptic, you say, yeah, but I got more questions. Well, that's fine. That's fair. You can have more questions and you can present challenges. But I want you to know we're not just ad hoc just slapping up all these things that we like. And often that's how it's framed when philosophy professors at universities. Um, I have a, a video from recently where I showed a, a philosophy professor doing this very thing. And on YouTube videos, people will say, this is the part of the argument where people just put in whatever they want. A Christian God that answers prayers and heals people and all that. Um, we're not saying that. We are just saying that this gives you theism, which is God. It gives you a personal God. Mm -hmm. um, but people like me and like Mike, I think, are the kinds of apologists that would say, all right, we would give this argument to give you a good reason to believe in God, but then we would follow it with something like a case for the resurrection of Jesus, because then we would put a name tag on that God, right? Mm -hmm. Then we would, we would, uh, we, we want to show that there's a God, because then that's a good explanation for God raising Jesus from the dead, mm -hmm. but we would follow it with a case for the resurrection. So a person yeah. would be right to say, yeah, this doesn't give you everything you want, but it's a beginning point. It's a, it's the first part of this case, uh, or can be for Christian theism. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think that's pretty significant. And we could, we have to realize too, it, it doesn't get you, um, all of scripture and all of the Christian doctrine, but I'm sorry if, if you're atheist and you now have a description of God that fits the Bible, although it doesn't affirm everything the Bible affirms yet, it fits the Bible. I'm like thinking, how is this not a big win? You know, how is this not right. a wonderful right. thing? I've ruled out a bunch of other religious views. I've isolated it down to a handful of like Abrahamic religions that, you know, we have, we have Judaism, Christianity. I don't know if Islam really fits this, but we have just a handful. And then now we can take it to the next step and continue the discussion. And also when we bring evidence for prophecy in the Bible or for the miracles of Jesus, you no longer feel compelled to reject it because you don't believe in God. You now realize miracles are at least possible because God exists. Let's evaluate whether one happened with the resurrection of Jesus. And so this is part of a, a, a this is a huge movement. You know, if you go from not believing in God to believing in God, that's a, quite a big deal, quite a big deal. And this is just one argument. This is just one argument amongst right. a slew of arguments we can offer for God's existence. Uh, what were we going right. to say? And, about and before you go on, before you go on to the question and answer, I would say, you know, th you mentioned, or we both mentioned, the design arguments that often get brought up alongside this one, and it's because they do pair pretty well together. Uh, but this is why you often get, okay, you've got the Kalam, then you've got a design argument, and m many classical apologists will also bring a moral argument, and the reason for that is because then you can show there's good reason to believe this God has is a loving God. He, you know, he's got moral inclinations that he wants good for people, that he has uh, moral principles that he wants us to follow. So all of these things kind of flow together. Um, this is just one, like you said at the beginning of the show, one of many great reasons to believe that God exists or that the Christian God exists. Yeah. 
<clears throat> Good stuff. All right, we're going to your guys' questions. And while we're doing that, so these are questions pulled right from the live stream, you know, during our actual discussion. Um, we, ha we don't have a, we don't even know what they are yet. So we're not like vetting these. <laughs> we're just being sent to us by uh, my, my, um, super awesome mods uh, aj bernard thanks man and all the other mods that are in there i really appreciate you guys by the way don't say that enough um <clears throat> but while we're going to these questions i just want to let you know i've put braxton's youtube channel down in the description and i encourage you guys to check it out if you like apologetics that's really what he focuses on and i put one particular video called a christian response to 15 atheist youtubers that we thought you might guys you guys might find especially interesting so um here we go let's go to your guys questions <clears throat> uh, david mcdreamy says if you get to questions, could you do a quick primer on John 8, 1 through 11? The draw in the sand story, whether it should remain or not. Thanks. Okay, so this is more of a <clears throat> of a theological question. <coughs> Pardon me. So um, for this, Dave, let me, let me point you to, um, before I get to my answer, let me point to you to my YouTube channel. I have a playlist called Evidence for the Bible. In that playlist, I get I get into three videos where I deal with variants in um, in in ancient manuscripts about like how do we know what the text originally said. I get into that in great detail, and the the process of studying for that teaching helped me solidify my own understanding on these issues and my my understanding of John eight. And I'd be interested in hearing Braxton's thoughts too. Uh, this is the story of the woman caught in adultery. Everyone's familiar with it, right? And Jesus says, you know, neither do I condemn you to the to the lady, right? He doesn't let others throw stones at her. And I I think that this is very, very likely, you know, there's a good likelihood that it's a true story or a, tr a true memory of something that happened with Christ, but that it wasn't originally part of John. And that the the people who were transcribing the text, they wanted to preserve the story. And so it, we find it in ancient manuscripts in one place in John, at the end of John, in a different place. We find it moving around like they're trying to find a way to preserve the story. Um, we we have it in the King James Version, New King James Version, we have it there, but most translations will put it in brackets to indicate, hey, this is likely not original. Like most likely this section is not original. Does that mean that we've we've uh, we've lost the Bible or something? No, the question is what's original? That's the question at hand. And I go through, a, the thing is this information I think bothers people when they first hear it. Um, and so for that, I, I point you to that series where I <clears throat> unpack these things in careful detail, try to give you all the answers to your questions. There's a bunch of questions that come up when you hear this, and I have all that answered there. Braxton, what do you think? I think that sounds fantastic. I think it's important to note that a lot of times you'll hear skeptics say things like, look, your Bible has things in it that all the scholars know uh, aren't true or whatever. First of all, I think that's overstating it. And number two, um, it's important to note that the, the most Bibles will bracket uh, the two or three places where there's something that may not be in all the manuscripts or something. So um, yeah. I think that's important. Yeah, there's really just two major passages <clears throat> that come up that I think people are going to be most interested in. It's the ending of Mark, and it is this ch this passage in John 8. And uh, that's pretty much the two major passages that you're going to be thinking about and wanting to know about. I deal with that in that video series, Evidence for the Bible. Um, look at the, the videos re relating to variants and um, has the Bible been changed? Those kinds of questions. So, so yeah, uh, but no, we can say with great assurance what the originals said, and that's why they have brackets around that to tell you, here's what we, here's what we know. All right. Toby Noble says, question for Mike. I saw a sermon once that I don't really agree with, but I'd like to know how to answer its topic. The sermon said that if an individual struggles with any, uh, any kind of addiction, whether it's alcohol or other things like adult things, um, video games or TV, they say you haven't reached the first rung of Christianity. So you're not a Christian. Um, also, if you if you fear hell in any capacity or any way, you're not a Christian. <clears throat> um, that sounds silly. <laughs> uh, where's the scripture that says that if you struggle with sin, you're not a Christian? Why does Paul tell us don't walk in the walk in the spirit and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh? He, you know, when he rebukes the Corinthians for all kinds of major issues in their lives, he doesn't just say, "Well, obviously you're not Christians." So, you know, he even he even has a category called carnal. You're carnal to them. He he says. So I I think that that seems silly. Um, I'm not speaking to the sermon because I didn't hear the sermon. I, I won't be able to comment on that. But the description you gave sounds silly to me and I don't think it's a very healthy place to be as a Christian. Do you fear hell as a Christian? Well, first John talks about that, that, um, that he who fears has not been made perfect in love because perfect love casts out fear. Fear involves torment. 
the idea here is I'm scared of future torment like God might really judge me. But the text of 1 John, I believe it's 1 John 5, it seems to be saying, hey, you might even as a Christian be fearful of those things, um, but you haven't yet realized the fullness of God's love for you. That doesn't mean that you're not a Christian, right? Because God is great. Even if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. So in effect, this if you fear hell, you're not a Christian, this idea is like saying, um, if your heart condemns you, it's right. <laughs> you're condemned. Well, thank God, First John is there to say, even if our heart condemns us, he's greater than our hearts and knows all things. And so, yeah, um, just rest in your trust and hope. Oftentimes, fear and faith will coincide together at the same time, and you simply choose to trust God regardless. Uh, Braxton, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? No, that was beautiful. I wouldn't touch it. All right, cool. <laughs> and um, I like this guy, Braxton. He's a good guy. <laughs> uh, first and last says, <clears throat> or first last says, how could one test if a financial blessing or promotion is blessed by God? Um, tips for how to be wise with money. It makes me nervous, especially with the warnings Jesus gave about wealth. Um, Braxton, what, what, what's your thoughts on that? So I've been taking these. How would you test if your financial blessing is, is from God, is a blessing from God? Well, I, I would just um, look at the context. Uh, does it? Do, I mean, we. I don't think we could necessarily know for certain. There might be some extreme cases of answered prayer. You know, there's a great story that uh, Mike Lycona gives um, in, in a video. I, 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 there's a there's a video out there on his channel where he he talks about how this. I'm going to get it wrong. I'm going to get details wrong, but say there was a couple that that the the young man wanted to go to seminary and he didn't have the money that he needed to go to seminary and he was praying that God would allow for him to have this and it was this isn't it but let's just say it's something like he needed $2532.67 okay and he found out that he had um, some savings bonds that his grandmother had left him that had matured and they were found in his attic or whatever and her attic and and it turns out that they had come to exactly that uh, 2600 and whatever it was exactly to the cent Okay, that's an example of what we call extreme answered prayer. Uh, that guy could be pretty confident uh, that, that God answered that prayer so he could go to seminary. I think that some important things when we talk about prayer is that we follow the parameters that the Bible gives us for prayer, and there are several. Um, one of those is that we ask things in, in, the, in, in God's name. Uh, those would be things not just, not just saying in Jesus' name at the end of a prayer, like it's some kind of a magic talisman or something, but that we're asking in the name of our patron, something that he would, we're asking for things that would be consistent with his will. And of course, the Bible says, ask according to his will. And we should ask without just selfish motives. And when we follow these prescriptions that the Bible gives us for what prayer can be like, we can have greater confidence that um, our prayers might be answered, not that they'll necessarily uh, be answered the way we like. And, um, and, and so I think in that context, if you receive some kind of a blessing, you'll be in a much better place to judge whether or not it seems like it was consistent with what God would have wanted for you. <clears throat> yeah, to me, um, one thing I would look, I mean, I'm not sure if I know how to answer this question. I'm just gave you some ideas. I would look for would be, um, did I gain this in, in godliness? It, did this thing come to me in godliness or did it come to me through my compromise? Um, however it came to you though, um, being, being wise with money is going to be a thing of using it for, using it in godliness, use it for the Lord, use it seeking first his kingdom and his righteousness. And, um, and there's a lot more you're probably going to want answers for on that. But those are, those are tips that I think would apply to a variety of situations. Am I seeking for God's kingdom and righteousness right now? Does that mean you can't use it to buy yourself a nice dinner? No, not necessarily. But if, if that dinner money was going to go towards your rent and you're not going to pay your bills now because of it, that would be unwise. Like you want to be paying your commitments, you know, so there's a way to apply it. Um, <clears throat> Toto Bermundo says, is it okay to mock atheists because they believe in nothing? Uh, creating the universe when they mock you for believing in God. And I'll, I'll share, I don't usually do this, right? I, I, I tend to think, I tend to not want to do that sort of thing, mockery. I think that there's a place for mockery though. I think there's a proper place for it. I tend to just not be very good at thinking of when to do that sort of thing. And I don't really want to. Um, but generally speaking, my, my thought is, I'd rather have a cordial conversation with them. And in, in real life, when I get to the point where the atheist just mocks and ridicules me, I'm just done talking to them. I don't know. What's your opinion, Braxton? 
Yeah, I have a video on my channel that, that breaks down, I think, four different types of atheist YouTube channels. And one of those is the provocateur is what I called it. And that's the, the type of channel where you have some somebody just mocking and making jokes. And sometimes they're kind of obscene about Christianity. And I think that for, for a person who feels called to engage with a person like that, it requires a very special kind of patient person, a person who's very discerning because mm -hmm. they're Oftentimes when we, uh, I was just answering an email from someone today who was saying, do you ever, uh, when people attack you online or get real snarky like that, do you have trouble resisting coming back? And I do sometimes find myself maybe not answering the right way and I have to really watch myself, but you have to be really discerning. And I think it's good to, to recognize if I'm not able to do that, maybe I shouldn't be the person who, who engages that way. There are people yeah. who are very discerning and very cautious and maybe those are the kind of people who are wise enough to know when that mockery might be okay. But for me, I'm like you, Mike. I'm not sure I'm the guy for that. If I ever say anything snarky, uh, you know, I, I, it's very rare. I try not to do that. Yeah, for me, it just tends to lead to me being in the flesh. And then the problem, you know, mockery very likely tends to me tends to lead to me being in the flesh. So that's the problem. But mockery may have a real and legit place. Let's just say I'm not very good at figuring out what that is. <laughs> so, um <clears throat> Let's see. Um, can you explain? This is Kresha Hicks. Can you explain Revelation 21 verses 1 and 2 as it pertains to God being outside of time? Am I correct in my understanding that this scripture is referring to heaven? Let's let's pull up that verse and take a quick look at it. Revelation 22 verses 1 and 2. <clears throat> I can actually put this on the screen for you guys so everybody can be on the same page. Hmm. Now, some feel like this is we're answering questions that are not on the topic of the stream. And I'm, I like I prefer those kinds of questions. But I also realize that people have just been waiting to ask questions. And this is the question you have and you're hoping for a good answer. Sorry, Braxton's still here. I, you just don't see him right now. Instead, you see the Bible, which is way better than Braxton anyways. Um, it says, it says uh, <clears throat> then the angels showed me the river of the water of life, bright as a crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb, through the middle of the street of the city, also on either side of the river, the tree of life, with its 12 kinds of fruit, yielding its fruit each month. I'm assuming that the idea that there's time in heaven is kind of where we're, we're getting this, um, this question from. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's see. Yeah, I, I've gotten this question before. I, if you want, I can speak to it. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so often we talk about, you know, we, we think about heaven and we're like when time will be no more and, and all these things. But then you also get, uh, uh, you know, in that very chapter, just a few verses later, you saw uh, months. It's talking about a month. You know, that's a that's a temporal uh, occurrence, a month. That's a that's a time-based term. So um, when, when we think about heaven being a place where time will be no more, that sort of language is more poetic, talking about the idea that, you know, it's it's going to be everlasting. We're not going to run out of time, right? We're going to, I think that's the, the idea that's, it's, it, that's being used there. That would be an equivocation. We're not talking about timelessness. Mm -hmm. And also, heaven will very much be a part of the created universe. We will be um, uh, in the new heaven and the new earth earth will be um, have our physical bodies and we will be in time um, I found oftentimes that church people and Christians I've been guilty of this sometimes we didn't tend to say silly things about time and and come to wrong conclusions with the best intentions because uh, of the way that sometimes the Bible talks about time in respect to eternity but the idea here is time will be no more in the sense that we're not going to run out of time this is going to be everlasting this is never going to come to an end but we're still going to have a passing of months and um, and, and it will be in the physical universe which is a temporal place so I think that's yeah. a good explanation of what's going on there <clears throat> I, f I fully agree and I in my younger years I thought of heaven as being a static condition and then I also thought of it as being a really long worship song and both of those were wrong and they are self-contradictory <laughs> you can't right you know you can't be like we're singing songs for how long for timeless it, like no that doesn't make any sense like i was just it was like i mixed things i heard in church but primarily stuff i saw in cartoons as a kid and i was developing my doctrine of heaven from like looney tunes anyways uh let me just say yeah <laughs> we're time will never stop Right, it's it's eternal yeah. in the sense that it goes on with with no end. That in that sense, time never ends. God, His timelessness is a different kind of quality, 
But I do think God is engaging in time with us. Like he's interacting in time with us. So when we say God's outside of time, uh, some people would say, like I know William Lane Craig's view, God's outside of time before the beginning of the universe. At the point the universe begins, God enters time and is engaging and interacting with us. And so there's an element in the to, sense in the yeah. sense that he can't help but know that for us it's you know uh, whatever it is for you six fourteen in in California mm -hmm. um, on a Tuesday night he knows that and so in that sense he's in time because of his awareness of what time it is for us right so so yeah that's what Craig Craig uh, says there but but yeah I I've even heard people say things like. What is music going to be like in heaven when there's no time? How can you even have music? What kind of amazing music will be timeless? Yeah. Well, there wouldn't be. That's, that's easy to answer. Yeah, and of course, heaven's uh, not yeah. just a long song. Okay, I think there's a huge right. variety. Just like there's a variety of experiences in life right now, there's a variety of experiences in heaven. Um, don't limit yeah. yourself into thinking it's a long song. Um, but that's not a biblical view. That's just something weird I thought because of cartoons. Um, <clears throat> so let's see. Um, Question for Braxton. It says, what does Braxton say about a universe, an infinite universe, causing our universe in a bounce? Wouldn't that go against okay, so that's, razor? Uh, that's what so it I'm sounds like he, question, yeah. He, yeah, it sounds like they're either talking about um, a kind of a cyclical model where you have like a, a universe expanding and then contracting and then expanding and contracting or... Uh, or they could be talking about another timeline outside of uh, our universe's timeline. That's kind of like a meta timeline, and I'm not sure uh, which of those. Uh, for the cyclical model, I think that still runs into the same problems that you have with an infinite past, because you even I think you would still have the problem of uh, past infinite temporal moments, but you would definitely have a, an infinite past series of events, and neither one of those are. Uh, possible, I don't think. Um, as for uh, if they mean another timeline outside of our timeline, um, that timeline would then have the same problem of an infinite past for itself. So, uh, mm -hmm. so I that's I'm not sure about the question, but that's my that's my take on it. It sounds like it's arbitrarily pushing things back one step. Um, okay, mm -hmm. so question also for. For both of us, from Travis Lee, um, what do you recommend when a Christian begins to feel static in their walk? Hmm. What would you say, Braxton? Uh, for me, I think when that happens to me, um, what I do is I make a concerted effort to spend time in the Word and spend time in prayer. Now, that sounds like um, uh, uh, a really obvious churchy answer, but I'll tell you what else What I specifically pray for. I pray that God would increase my um, my love and dedication for him. So uh, the example I give of this is like, I think that we sometimes get kind of legalistic, kind of like the Pharisees where we think if, if I could just, if I could just do these certain things, then I'll be on fire for God. I'll be pleasing God. If I read my Bible, spend time in prayer, go to church, you know, tell someone about Jesus occasionally. And, um, I think that legalistic way of approaching it is kind of like a man with his wife. He thinks I'm pleasing my wife. I'm being a good husband. If, what I do is I kiss my wife at least once a day. I tell her I love her once a week. I buy her flowers once a month and all these kind of things. When the answer is, no, no, no. If a man would love his wife, if he would fall in love with his wife all over again, then all those things, he wouldn't have to keep them like a list. They would just come naturally. Mm. And I think in the same way, if you could fall in love with Jesus in a deeper way, that static situation would go away and you'd start doing all these things that, that kind of invigorate your Christian life. Now you might say, yeah, but... How do I fall in love with Jesus again? And I think the answer to that is pray. Ask God to help you with that. And then read your scripture and look for look for God to to work in your life that way. So that would be my answer to that question. And see, if you had a dog, I don't think you'd be having these problems right now. <laughs> is, it really, is it really a problem, though? <laughs> um, uh, my thought is, you know, as, as you're sharing this, I'm thinking of Revelation, the letter to the church in, in Ephesus. And I encourage you to go and read that letter. Uh, read read the message of Jesus to the church in Ephesus and he gives him a few encouragements and one of them is <clears throat> is he says remember the first works and he's like go back and remember the or recall and go and do the first works I should say those things that you did before when you were on fire for me when you were seeking me when you were loving me go do that and and come back to that first love and if there's issues of of sin maybe maybe sin that 
you've just become kind of a little callous to it's pray that God would help tear the calluses off, you know, and, and that, that your health, the health of your relationship with him would be restored and reinvigorated and start thinking on eternal things. Uh, don't be satisfied with just what's happening in this world, but think about the glory of God and the eternity we have with Christ. And uh, um, those are the things I would encourage you to do. Um, let's <clears throat> take our last question for tonight. Um, last question. This, this is from crazy Jesse. Crazy Jesse's got a question for us. He says, how can you say an argument which premises can neither be confirmed or denied demonstrate something? We don't know whether or not the universe began to exist. Yeah, so the response to that is, and we kind of gave this response, we don't know if the universe began to exist. Well, then that would mean that the universe is past infinite. That's what that would mean. And we talked about that, and, and it's possible someone came to the stream late. I would encourage you to go back and listen to the video again, or for the first time perhaps, that portion of the video, and listen to us talk about why a past infinite universe doesn't make much sense. And that would kind of be the answer that we would give. Simply put, if the universe were past infinite, you, you, there's, you never started traveling along that timeline to get to today. And secondly, you could never cross an infinite amount of time because no matter how much time you crossed, you still have infinite to go to get to this moment in time. So, um, so I think you can, you can uh, give evidence for these premises. Yeah, and that's, I would just honestly encourage you, Crazy Jesse, I don't know if maybe you just popped onto the live stream just now, or maybe you <clears throat> maybe you were kind of like sort of listening. Um, we gave lots of good reasons to think those premises are true. Things that begin to exist have a cause. Like, you don't, you know, when you're an explosion outside your house, you're not thinking, probably nothing caused that. <laughs> of course, you're not thinking that. These things... These things seem to be really solidly true, and that's that's why we would choose them to uh, to be building an argument for God's existence. We're taking what we think we can agree on to try to show you that this points towards God. And there's lots of arrows, lots of other arguments, other reasons to believe in God. And what's interesting in atheist debates, we'll close on this thought. I think atheist debates, like you'll watch debates with, um, uh, say, William Lane Craig, Christopher Hitchens, or these guys, a whole bunch of different debates I've seen, many, many, many debates. Frequently, the, the Christian comes and they come with a list of arguments and reasons for believing something. And most often, the atheist doesn't have any arguments except for, nah, -uh, I'm not convinced. And if you listen to the debate with that, you're like, wait a minute, wouldn't a more balanced debate be, here's my careful thought out reasons why God doesn't exist. Here's premise, premise to conclusion, you know, why God doesn't exist. That's what I'd expect if it was more of a fair kind of thing. But instead, what often happens is what uh, Matt Dillahunty suggests for his people, and I see other guys do it. Uh, Cosmic Skeptic in his video on the Kalam, he even he even came out and said it. He's like, it's important to know. I'm not saying that I know what happened here. We're just saying we're not convinced about what you're saying. And this is like the weakest objection you can come up with. And I think that it's it's showing that, hey, Christians have lots of good reasons to think God exists. Atheists just have lots of objections, which can often generally be answered very well. The evidence seems to be pushing in one direction. And we do encourage you to then, if, you, if you're convinced by that, to start seeking the Lord, start praying, start reaching out to this God who made you, who created you, and who has revealed himself through Christ. He took your sins upon himself. He loves you. The forgiveness of your sin is available to you. Um, start, start, start hearing him. Start paying attention to him. Start caring about these eternal and incredibly valuable things. Um, and we hope that this has been a blessing to you guys. We hope that it's going <clears> to <throat> encourage you in being able to interact with people, talk to them more thoughtfully. You can come back to this video when you get objections and you're like, wait a minute, how did they answer that? <laughs> That's meant to be a resource for you. And if you like Braxton's stuff, you can uh, you know, go subscribe to him on YouTube. I'm hoping to help push other YouTubers, Christian YouTubers up into the forefront since God's blessed me with a platform here. And Braxton's one of those guys who I would like to see um, having more of a platform on here as well. So hopefully we can see that happen. Uh, Braxton, anything in closing you want to say to everybody? I just want to say thanks for watching the stream. And Mike, thank you so much for having me on. Uh, you are a friend, but it's an honor to be on the channel. This is such a powerful channel. And we're so I'm so glad that we have someone like you um, with a channel of, of this size and this influence. And so thank you so much for having me on. And I do hope this has been helpful for some people. Cool. All right. Thanks, guys. God bless you. Have a great one. And make sure to uh, check out... Braxton's good stuff.